Today is August 12, 1998. Conducting an interview with the liberator Leon Bass, B-A-S-S, -S, born as Leon Bass, B-A-S-S. -S. My name is Barbara Byer, B-Y-E-R. We're in Newtown, Pennsylvania in the U.S. and the interview will be conducted in English. Today is August 12, 1998. I'm conducting an interview with the liberator Leon Bass, B-A-S-S, -S, born as Leon Bass, B-A-S-S. -S. My name is Barbara Byer, B-Y-E-R. We're in Newtown, Pennsylvania in the U.S., and the interview will be in English. Can you tell me your name, please, and spell it? Uh, my name is Leon Bass, L-E-O-N-B-A-S-S. -S. And your date of birth, Mr. Bass? I was born January 23rd, 1925. And you're how old now? I'm now 73 years of age. Where were you born? I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And your mother's name? My mother's name is Nancy Weston Bass. Her occupation she was? was? She was a house uh, maker, a housewife. And your father's name? My father's name is Henry Cleveland Bass. And his occupation? He was a Pullman porter on the railroad. Where were your parents born? My dad was born in Bennettsville, South Carolina. My mother was born in Hopkins, South Carolina. And how many brothers and sisters did you have? I had four brothers and one sister. And their names? Um, my sister, the oldest, was named LaBelle House. Um, my oldest brother was Henry C. Bass. Claude Bass, then I was born. Then Harvey Bass, and finally Marcellus Bass. And how was it for you growing up in the city of Philadelphia? Oh, growing and living in the city of Philadelphia was a wonderful experience for all of us at that young formative age. Uh, we had a lot of fun playing games in the neighborhood. There were so many of us. We had cousins and all of those made it possible for us to have all the teams we would want in terms of baseball or football. We were never exposed to any of the ugliness of pain that our parents experienced in South Carolina. All of that prejudice and hatred, uh, we were insulated from that. Uh, so growing up was not too bad. What lessons of morality and tolerance were taught at home in your house? My father and mother were sticklers about behavior, discipline, order, and godliness. And they made us all know that we could respect all people, especially those who were older. But we should respect all people and not judge anyone on the basis of superficial things. Um, and so they didn't take us back to South Carolina because they didn't want us to see and hear some of the things that caused people to hate. So our, our lives were pretty well regulated. Who and what influenced you most when you were young? I have to say my parents, number one. Uh, my mother, who was always there when Dad was away for more than a week or two, she was always there to uh, keep us in line, to keep us focused on that which was important, to see that we did our home assignments from school, and that we lived up to those things that were important, all of the values that they felt were necessary for us to learn early on. Uh, my father was a giant of a man, even though he was not as tall as I am today. But he was a giant in terms of his strength. He was a, a loving person who cared and gave so much to so many and never looked for any kind of self-gratification from that. Uh, I admired him so much, and more so as I got older, and unfortunately so much more after he'd passed away. He was just a wonderful person. There are things about him that I remember that uh, will cause me to cheer up. My, my father died and my brother and I went to a, a mom and pop store where he used to visit on his way home from the railroad station. And uh, I recall that we went in there one day and there was uh, the owner who was standing at the counter, but at the other end of the counter there was a woman crying. 
and uh, he said, your father came into my store and he saw that woman crying. And so he came over to me and said, what's wrong? And I told him the lady wanted more food without paying. And she wanted to feed her children, but I have let her have as much as I can and I'm not in a position to do any more. So my father said to him, he said, look, you give her what she needs. Every time she comes in, you give it to her, put it on my bill, and I'll pay you when I come by. But don't tell her I did that. And he said, for more than a year and a half, your father paid for that lady's sustenance, and she never knew. So you had a wonderful father. So those are things I, I struggle to try to live up to, but I don't know whether I can reach it. Where did you go to school? I went to school in Philadelphia, elementary school, which was an all-black elementary school, but by golly, it was one of the best. <laughs> the teachers were for real. They made you toe the mark, and they made you live up to all of the things that you were supposed to live up. It was like an extension of the home, really, uh, for us. Then I went to a mixed school, uh, junior high school in those days, and then finally to high school, West Philadelphia High School. And it was in 1943 that I was finally graduated from that school. What were your favorite subjects while you were in school? <laughs> My favorite subjects it certainly was not Latin, I can tell you that. But oh, the Latin, oh my. And algebra, those things were really difficult. But history was one of my favorite subjects. And English, too, especially if it came to Shakespeare and all the literary giants of history. So uh, those are some of the favorite subjects. And of course, art. Yeah. And who were your friends while you were young? My friends, when I, was, when I was young, I had mostly friends in the neighborhood, uh, friends who were black as I am. But when I went to school, to the integrated junior high school, I had a fellow who sat next to me alphabetically. And uh, my name was Bass, his name was Blumberg, Leonard Blumberg. And Leonard and I became very good friends. Uh, he was a wonderful guy. But our connection only existed in that school. When, he, when school was over, he went home to his neighborhood. I went home to my neighborhood. It was a shame that we never could get closer than just in school. So if he wasn't your friend uh, after school, who were your friends after school? After school, my friends were those who, like me, were racially the same. Um, they were friends of my brothers and uh, friends of mine. Uh, some of them were fellows who got into deep trouble, but they were still our friends, but we never would go with them when they were going into something that was not correct. We always knew that we had a, some place to go, which was home, um, but they were still our friends. Who was your best friend? One of my best friends was a young man by the name of Philip Wing. He was a braggadocia young guy. He's always on stage. He always had to seem to be proving himself. And, uh, but somehow I, I saw something in him that I liked. And he and I became good friends and we traveled together. Uh, tried to keep him out of trouble. Mm -hmm. What were your views on life when you were just a teenager? Oh gee, as a teenager, I guess I was concerned about girls. Yes, I'll be very honest about that. Yes, but I was never one that uh, felt very secure about uh, that situation. I, I didn't quite know how to talk or deal with them. I, I always wanted to know if I could achieve. I had some doubts, and I, had, I don't know why, but I sometimes wondered if I was going to be able to do all the things that I wanted to do. Um, and that followed me for a number of years. You mentioned that you had uh, a young man whose name obviously sounds Jewish. What did you know about Jews and Judaism? Nothing at the time. I didn't know what being Jewish meant. I just knew that they were white. <laughs> I, I guess I put all of them in the same category, being white. I've heard the term Jew, uh, but uh, I couldn't make any connection with it. And I think that went on until I really got into the service of the United States Army. And it was then that I began to know more. How was it in Philadelphia at that time for an African-American? That's an interesting question because 
I remember living in this encapsulated world of blackness and then going to school, which was black. But whenever I wanted to go to the cinema, the movie we say, uh, it was a black theater uh, in the neighborhood. And then if I wanted to go outside of the neighborhood, we had to sit in the balcony. There was no law, but it was an unwritten law. And uh, we would crowd into the back balcony to see all the films that came along. I didn't put any too much stock in it at that time because, uh, I don't know, I, I just felt that this is the way things were being done and I couldn't do anything about it. I just had to go and sit there. So we never really got into any deep discussions about the disparity, you see. What kind of person were you at that time? I think I was a very sensitive person. Um, I read a lot of books. What kind of uh, books? Well, my father brought home books from the uh, train. People would leave them. He would bring them home. I remember reading um, Les Miserables, and I remember in, in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, I remember reading um, what was so many others. I, I can't remember all of them now, but those were the kind of books that Call of the Yukon, that's right, I remember that one. And uh, my parents thought I might be interested in playing the piano, and that was a big bust, but I did it anyway, and I think I got to know something about music, even though I couldn't play very well. But I got to appreciate some of the classics that came along. Uh, I, I think I was a very sensitive person. I, I think I could cry very easily. I don't know why, but I did. And I wondered, I said, Leon, you've got to be stronger than this. But, but as I look back now, I, that's the kind of person I was. What kind of church did your family attend? In my early life, um, my parents didn't really attend church. My mother never did go to church. On Sunday, my father would take us, all of us, the four youngest ones, and he would go off to a, uh, a Baptist church. Uh, he didn't belong there, but he would go and take us. And so that was as much connection with the religion we had then. But then my mother got religion. Oh boy, when she got religion, then she dumped it on us in a real way and until it was running out of my ears, as I said. And uh, I revolted at 15 or 16 and, and said, no more. It was a holiness kind of religion. But the people were wonderful in that church. They cared about each other and they cared about those who were sick and those who needed help. No one would go hungry. I, I admired them for that. But I just couldn't go and sit through all of that ritual. What event happened in her life that all of a sudden she became religious? I don't know, but I have a feeling, and I've never shared this before. And I think it's a feeling that my sister, who when she was about 17 or 18, left home. And I never knew the reasons why, but I think she and mom had some controversy about a lifestyle. And uh, she left home, and my mother w was really distraught and I could hear her crying at night. But I think she must have at least heard some something on the radio about what the minister was speaking and it was singing, and she went over to this church that was having some kind of revival, and I think it was there that she found some comfort and some release, and uh, she became very religious. So what, would you, what role has religion played in your life up until now? Religion is, well, organized religion never really struck me as being so very important. I think that there is that of God in all of us, and I don't care if it's Allah or Jehovah or whether you call it God, or whatever it is, it's a force that created all of us and keeps everything here in order in this universe. And I, I feel that we worship that and we go through a ritual. And we get on our knees, we count our beads, we shout and sing and do all of these things uh, to acclaim our allegiance to a God. Uh, the ritual is all right, as long as it points us and gives us a focus on what we should be doing. And oftentimes we get into our religion, and the religion doesn't steer us in the right way. As soon as we put down our, 
our beads as soon as we come home from church, then we've forgotten all about what it is we should do. So the, the ritual is important, but it's only important if it focuses us, all of us on what it is we should be about. That's the point of view I have today. When did you enter the military? It was 1943. I completed high school, and I was I became well aware there was not too many jobs available, even though the war was on. Um, and I just said, well, I think I'd better join the Army, because I thought maybe this would give me a chance for travel and some adventure and a kind of experience, uh, get to know what's going on. And maybe a little patriotism, too, because my, my father was in the service and he loved his country. What service was he in? He was in the United States Army. He was with the expeditionary force that went to France in the First World War to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, that was a contradiction, of course, when you think about what was going on in South Carolina and other places. But my dad did that because he believed in his country. And so like my father, I, I too went off to war. How old were you? I was 18 years of age at that time, and I volunteered. In what branch of the military? I became part of the United States Army. Where did you receive your basic training? I was sent down into Georgia, outside of Macon, Georgia, a place called Camp Wheeler. It was an infantry training, basic training camp. And I was with a battalion of soldiers, 600 and all, all, all black. We were there f to get trained as infantry soldiers. How we, was it for you? Well, it was a very difficult time for me to understand the order, the discipline that you had to experience. And of course, I learned, maybe the hard way sometimes, but I learned that how I should comport myself and uh, as a soldier. And uh, sometimes I had to acquiesce to things that I didn't want to. Some of the things that the military maintained, it was an institutional racism and they helped to maintain it with the segregation and the way we were treated at the camp. So I didn't like that, but I had to learn to con carry myself in such a way that I could survive. What was your rank after basic? I was still a sergeant, uh, I mean a, a, a private, and I became a PFC after some time. I don't know why they just gave it to you when you, after a certain length of time. Your serial number? 337-85413. And to what unit were you assigned? I was assigned at that time uh, to the basic training unit, but when we finished that, they said, we will now assign you to combat engineers. So they created the 183rd Engineer Combat Battalion. And for further training, they sent us into Mississippi. And then we went on war games in Texas and Louisiana. We finally ended up being billeted in Camp Joseph T. Robinson, right outside of Little Rock in Arkansas. And from there, we went on up to Boston and crossed the Atlantic Ocean to England for overseas duty. Were the same men that you entered your basic training with, with you throughout that? Yes, all of the men who came with me were still with me, ex with the exception of a few, I imagine, who for health reasons otherwise were transferred out. And then some new men were transferred into uh, our unit. But all in all, they stayed together. Tell me about some of the men in your unit. I was fortunate in that I was in the headquarters company, and uh, we were assigned to the S2 section, which was the intelligence reconnaissance section for the battalion. And there must have been about maybe close to 10 of us altogether. And of those numbers, just about all of the young men had been to college or had graduated college. And of course, I was a high school graduate, and I fell into this group, and they helped to motivate me, to stimulate me, to make me see that there was something beyond high school for me, and that if they could do it, I could do it too. So I, I came out with an attitude that I had to further my uh, educational experiences. Some of the names of those men who influenced oh, there you? There was Sergeant Herbert Allen, who was a graduate of Cincinnati University. And there was uh, George Johnson, uh, who had finished Indiana University. Now there was uh, William A. Scott the third, who was uh, at least he was attending Morehouse uh, College down in Atlanta. Um, 
there were some others whose names I can't remember right now. Who was your commanding officer at that time? Our commanding officer, well, we had two that uh, they came and they had left, but the final officer who stayed with us was Captain, well, he now was a colonel, Colonel Fuller. I can't remember his full name, but F-U-L-L-E-R, Colonel Fuller. Where was he from? Oh, I don't know exactly, but I know he was a West Point graduate, and uh, he was quite a soldier. I admired him for his uh, ability to lead men. Uh, he was so much better than the other two. One was almost laissez-faire, his approach, and the other one was almost um, dictatorial in his approach. But I think Captain, at that time Captain Fuller, he, uh, he knew how to lead men. He knew how to get the best from you, and I admired him for that. Uh, as a unit, as a whole battalion of black men, how did, how did the white, the Caucasian officers, the commanders, treat you? Well, there were some that uh, were sort of neutral in terms of their manner and their attitude, but there were some who were definitely uh, uh, bigots and had racist uh, tendencies. And uh, it wasn't a pleasant experience sometimes because they allowed their feelings about race to come into how they would treat you as a soldier. And I, I didn't like that. So what were your duties then uh, when you left the United States and went to England? Well, we stayed in England for just about two, maybe three months at the most. And I know that it was in October that we left was it in October? No, October when we arrived in England. We left close to the Christmas season. It must have been in December. We crossed the English Channel to La Havre, France, and then we drove our trucks up through France, and we, we parked them outside of a small town alongside the road, and we had to wait there for orders. And while we were waiting, we lived out in a field uh, adjacent to that road. and. Uh, we stayed there for some time in some very terrible weather, raining, snowing, uh, but we had to wait for orders. We finally got those orders, and, and those orders told us that our unit, the 183rd Engineer Combat Battalion, would be attached to the 3rd Army under the leadership of General George Patton. And so that's where we were at that time, and those orders said that we had to move up and go into Belgium. And I remember driving all night uh, with blackout conditions uh, through rain and sleep all the way up into, through Arlon, Belgium, and on up into a place, I'm trying to remember the names, they're so hard, um, Stockholm, I think it was. We, we stopped there and s set up a camp, and then right away I had to go out on uh, reconnaissance with one of the officers, Captain Ellis, and the two others. We had to drive up to find out if there was some um, gravel or materials that we could use because we had a job to do. We had to build a bridge. And we had just arrived that night and we had the assignment to go look for these materials. And I remember driving up and all of a sudden two figures rose up in white and told us to halt. And they came up and demanded the password, which we did not know. And the captain kept saying, I am Captain Ellis. And they said, I don't give a damn who you are. Get out of the vehicle and give us the password. Well, he got out, but he couldn't give them the password. And so they came up. He was saying that we were Americans, you know. And he came up, and he wasn't sure because the Germans had been infiltrating the lines and saying they were Americans, and they spoke perfect English. But when they came up and looked in the vehicle and saw me, then they knew we were Americans because uh, this was a gentleman of color they were looking at. <laughs> What nationality were those? Those were American, Caucasian. Yeah, they were white soldiers in our army, but they had some doubts, and I don't blame them because of what was happening. And this was the Battle of the Bulge that we found ourselves involved in. What did you know about what was going on in the war? Very little, to tell you the truth. Um, things were happening so fast. We just knew that we were in the bulge. We just knew that the Germans were very close at hand. Um, we had gotten some news about the Malmedy massacre. Uh, um, we knew that there was a place called Baston, and that the men there were sort of captured and encircled, and that our job was to build a bridge which were blown out 
in, that was blown apart in a place called um, Montalange. So that's where we began our work. We began to build a bridge, and we did this. And there were times when the few airplanes that the Germans had would come over at night to try to bomb the bridge. They, we call them bed check charlies. They would come over to bomb anything to keep people honest, I guess. And sometimes they would throw in a few shells in the day. But we put the bridge up. Uh, it wasn't, I think, when you look at bridges, it was not what you call the best in the world. But somehow the fuel, the tanks, the armored vehicles, and the soldiers had to cross. They had to get up to Baston, so this bridge helped some of them do just that. What had you heard about Hitler? Well, I think Hitler's name was uh, synonymous with evil. Uh, he was someone that uh, wanted to take over our country. He was the one that wanted to enslave the world. He wanted to make fascism the thing. Um, we saw the films of the people saying Sieg Heil and all of this, and we knew that we had what you call a real foe to deal with. It was someone that was really trained in the art of warfare. Well, where did you see these films? Well, some of them were shown to us during the training and basic training, and uh, later on, and even overseas, we saw some that tried to keep us focused on who and what we were fighting. Um, unfortunately, none of this told us anything about what was really going on for the people in Germany and in other parts of Europe that had, where Hitler had in, overcome the people and taken over. We didn't know about concentration camps. We didn't know about the, the evil perpetrated against people who were Jews and who, who had other deficiencies. We didn't know that. I, at least I didn't know. These films that you watched, can you tell me something about their content? Well. I think the content would uh, show you the blitzkrieging of the uh, Germans as they went across Czechoslovakia and Poland. And, uh, the films that came out of that, um, I wonder sometimes if they were real or whether these were things put up so just to influence me and, to, and those like me to be uh, much more patriotic and giving us a reason to fight. And uh, I must be honest with you, I didn't feel I had a reason to fight. At that time, I felt that I was being used. I was fighting to promote all those wonderful things that Americans are supposed to enjoy, but I now knew that I was not permitted to enjoy what I was fighting for. And so I was an angry young soldier at that time. I'm sorry, I was angry at my country. And I, I carried that, even though I had to go through the war, I carried that feeling, that anger with me. I didn't hate, no. I didn't hate. You know, my parents taught me better than that. But I was really angry because I felt this was unjust. To put me out there to fight and to maybe die, to preserve something that I was not permitted to enjoy. So yes, I was angry. So after watching these films, what were you told? We're going to take a break now, and then we'll, yeah, I'll ask that question again. Okay. We're going to change tapes. Leon Bass, I was just about to ask you, Mr. Bass, then after looking at all these films that the Army provided uh, for training, what did you know about Nazi policy and Nazism? I knew very little about Nazism. Uh, the Nazis, as far as I was concerned, they were German soldiers. I didn't know anything about special training they had. I didn't know any of that. I just knew that these were German soldiers. But as the war went on and as um, things began to happen, uh, then I became much more educated as to those that I were happened to be fighting. Um, the Malmedy Massacre began to zero in on things for me. Tell where me about the, it. The, I heard about the almost close to a hundred soldiers were rounded up during the Battle of the Bulge and they were pushed out into a field and then they were systematically killed with machine gun fire. And a uh, few of them lived and to tell the tale. But uh, it was then that I began to know that there were people in charge that were called SS. These were what we call the real Nazis. Um, and so I figured there was a difference now. 
but I didn't know how significant that was going to be until much later in my Army life. What were your orders uh, in regard to civilians during the war? We were not to fraternize with them. They were the considered the enemy. We were not to do anything to them that was cruel and beyond the scope of our responsibilities. We could not live in the homes. If we went in and took over a house, they had to leave. We gave them only so much time to get their uh, the things they needed. And we would say, rouse, rouse, and they had, that was in German, and they had to get out. And then we would take it over as our headquarters, our, our billets. And what was their reaction to you when you came in? Well, these people were frightened. They were frightened. Um, I guess they had reason to be. I think they, in turn, knew what had happened whether they were participants or whether they were just those who supported the Nazi regime or whether they were those who were so frightened that they stood on the sidelines, did nothing. But they were frightened. So what contact did you have with civilians? Very little. Only in that position where they had to leave places that we were in. And we were all very cautious around them because we didn't know who was really a soldier or who was really a civilian. What is your most memorable experience or incident regarding a civilian? Oh, the German civilian or the, uh, there were Belgium civilians and others. I think there was one situation where I um, was doing an act of kindness for some people who were very kind to us. These were Belgian and the lady wanted some gasoline to, I think, to do something and I poured a little of my gasoline into her container and then she saw someone coming and she backed up and pushed me away and went, went into the house and there was the officer coming by and I didn't know what was wrong. I, I just went about what I had to do and the next day we got a copy of the Stars and Stripes and it said so many young men had been convicted of selling gasoline to civilians and I said, oh my God. I almost, almost got into some serious trouble for just doing a random act of kindness. And I found out that you have to be very careful about what you do in time of war. And how about with a German civilian? Well, the German civilians, I, had, I would make very little contact with them, even before the war was won and after, uh, none whatsoever. And what contact did you have with the opposition? With German soldiers? German soldiers, we saw a few of them. They were prisoners of war and they would be coming by on trucks. My contact with them was very limited. I recalled an incident back in the States when we went by a place with the so with the, and saw these uh, PWs and they were going into the restaurant to eat under guard but those who were guarding them were not permitted to go into that same restaurant and eat because they happened to be men of color. And I remembered that, but when I got overseas, I had very little contact with the enemy except to see them at a distance. Mm -hmm. And was there any contact at all with any civilian Jews before your war experience? I. Uh, civilian Jews, no. The, the one fellow that I met that was in school with me, I met him uh, in Europe. Yeah, I met him in Europe. I also met one when I was in the States, but that was the extent of my meeting uh, Jewish soldiers in my mili in, in the army. So, how would you describe your treatment by the Caucasian soldiers? For the most part, I would say it was uh, not bad. We had very little contact, you see, except if you go somewhere to uh, get equipment or something and they were the ones dispensing that equipment, then you had to talk with them and deal with them. Um, there was nothing positive done um, when I was in the States with the American uh, white soldiers. Overseas, I did have some contact. Uh, when I was um, way out of camp, and it was blackout conditions and I couldn't get back in time and they were shelling all around us. I was invited by this white soldier to come and uh, stay overnight with them. They were in some kind of a barn and they made room on the floor where I might sleep. 
I remember that. I remembered I could stop and get some food at their uh, kitchen. I was with an officer, and he would go, and I would go. We both would get food. I remember those uh, acts of kindness. Uh, so it made me know that I shouldn't say all. And uh, it was the beginning of my education. What unit and squad, platoon, regiment were you with just prior to, prior to your arrival at the camp? I was with the 183rd Engineer Combat Battalion. I was a battalion of 600 men. We were attached to Corps, the 8th Corps, and they gave us our orders as to where we should go and what we should do. And your CO at the time again? It was still uh, Colonel Fuller. Tell me about the exact incidents upon your arrival or up until the time you arrived at camp? I, w well, we were off uh, moving through Germany. We went through Belgium, Luxembourg. We crossed the Rhine River in Germany. We crossed in t and up through Frankfurt, and I saw places like Cologne, Dusseldorf, Bad Kruznach, Eisenach. And I know one day I was in Nuremberg. And shortly after that, my unit was given orders to go up into East Germany to a place called Weimar. And I was sent as a liaison, part of a liaison group, to see if we could arrange for a campsite for our unit. And uh, we arrived in this place called Weimar and drove out to what I found out now was to be a concentration camp. And I didn't know anything about concentration camps. So when the officer told us to follow him and get on the trucks, I did ask him, I said, where are we going? And he said, we're going to a concentration camp. Now, I really was puzzled because I didn't know a thing about that. No one had ever mentioned it in all the training I received. But on this day in April in 1945, I was going to have the shock of my life because I was going to walk through the gates of a concentration camp called Buchenwald. And you've got to believe me when I tell you I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> I was, I was totally unprepared for that kind of an experience. But you see, I can never, I can never forget that day. Because when I walked through that gate, I saw in front of me what I call the walking dead. I saw human beings, human beings that had been beaten, had been starved, had been tortured. They had been denied everything, everything that would make anyone's life livable. There they were standing in front of me and they were skin and bone. They had skeletal faces with deep set eyes. Their heads had been clean shaved and they were standing there and they were holding on to one another just to keep from falling. Many of them had sores on their bodies and I can remember this so vividly. Sores that came from the malnutrition. One man held out his hands his fingers had webbed together with the scabs that come from the sores brought on by the malnutrition. Oh my God, I'd seen nothing like this in all my life, nothing. But when they started to move and stumbling forward toward me, I backed away. Oh, I backed up and I stopped. And I said to myself, my God, my God, what is all this insanity? Who are these people? And furthermore, what have they done that was so terrible that would cause anybody to treat them like this? And you see, I didn't know, really. I didn't know. But there was this young man who spoke English, and he began to tell us about Bukitval. And he said that these people were, were Jews, they were gypsies, they were Jehovah Witnesses, and there were some Catholics. They were trade unionists, communists, homosexuals. He, oh, he went on and on. He listed so many different groups that had been placed in the camp. And I knew that in my judgment, the Nazis had placed them there because the Nazis were saying none of them were good enough. Therefore, they were not fit to live. They could be terminated, murdered. Man, I, I couldn't get a handle on this. This was beyond anything in my experience. But I walked about the camp. I went to a place where the men would sleep. They called it a barrack, and I opened the door. I stepped across the threshold and I closed the door, but I could go no further. You see that odor, the stench, 
that comes from death and, and human waste. Well, it was overpowering. It was awesome. I stood there and I was holding my breath all the time. I was holding my breath and I was going to leave. I knew I couldn't stay. And so I turned, but before I could step away, I looked down. And there on the bottom bunk near the door was a man. Oh, he was an emaciated person. He was skin and bone. He was on a bit of filthy straw and rags. And he was trying so desperately to look at me with that skeletal face and those deep set eyes. But he was so weak. You see, the man had been starved for so long and it was a struggle for him just to look at me. But finally he did. He looked up at me and he, he said nothing. Nor did I. So now I opened the door, stepped across the threshold, and closed the door. I was going to walk away from that place, but another man came by. He was, oh, he was skin and bone. And, and he stopped right there in front of me. He undid what was holding his trousers. He let them fall. He squatted down, and he began to defecate right in front of me. And I couldn't believe this. Oh, he was so thin. It looks like the... The bones of his buttocks would come through the skin. But I stood there saying, no, no, you don't do this in public. Where's your dignity? But you see, that was my hang-up. I was hung up on something called dignity when that man was merely trying to survive. He wanted to live. I didn't know. I, I, I went to another building, and a young man said, in this building you will find all parts of the human body in jars of formaldehyde. Now, this is the time in my young life when I found out that the Nazis did medical experiments on human beings at Buchenwald. And when the doctors would finish their operations, whatever part of the body they wanted to keep, they would take it, put it in a jar, and put on a label. Well, I couldn't read the German, but I could see. And I saw it all. What was in the jars? There were eyes and ears, fingers, hearts, livers, kidneys, Genitalia, all of it was there. On a table nearby was human skin. Human skin. Someone had done some kind of artwork on the skin. And in the room was a lampshade, and it too was made out of human skin. It's enough to boggle your mind. But I saw it. I went to another building. I was told this is where they interrogated prisoners to extract information. In reality, it was where they tortured them and I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe that anyone would torture anyone, not in 1945, not in a civilized society like Germany. But then I, I went inside the building. I saw the blackened blood on the cement floor. I saw the blood on the slab where they would put their victims and the restraints that would hold the victims in place. And on the wall, some of the instruments they used when they tortured people. Such as? Oh, kind all kinds of, it's hard to describe, things that would pull people apart. Fingernails. Uh, I, I wasn't too conversant with the kind of instruments, but uh, they looked hideous to me. Uh, and this is, these are the things they would use to punish and give pain to the inmates. Well, I thought it was, I'd seen enough. I, I was going to leave this place. I guess I'd been there about five hours, but um, I asked a young man about children. Because, you see, I'd been in the camp all this time, and I hadn't seen any children. So I said, where are the children? And he said, the children are in the camp. But, you see, I didn't see them. But when I was leaving this building, I saw the clothing of little children, the little children that didn't survive. Up against the wall, there were mounds of clothing. I saw the caps, the sweaters, the stockings, the shoes. For little babies, there were booties. I saw all of these things and more that belonged to little children. But I never saw a child. Finally, I, I walked past those that were dead, some others that were dying, to another building. And as I got close to this building, I could see the dead bodies. They were stacked outside of this building about four feet high, well, maybe five, eight, ten feet stretched across. 
they were up against this building called the crematorium. I went inside and I saw six ovens, six, and I walked over and I looked into one and I saw what was left of someone who had been placed there. I saw the man's blackened skull, the rib cage, the bones, the ashes. The young man said on a certain day in the week the Nazis would come with a truck and they would remove the ashes from all of the ovens throughout the entire camp. And then they, these ashes would be transported to a farm which they operated. And they would spread these ashes on the farmland as human fertilizer. I guess they believed that in time it would enrich the soil. And they could grow the things that would help them feed their army, the Wehrmacht. Mr. Bass. Yes. Let me ask you, who was this young boy that took you around? I don't know his name. To this day, I don't know his name. And also, let me go back just a moment. You said you arrived at the camp. Mm -hmm. Who was with you at the time? At the time, there was a lieutenant with us by the name of Brumall. And there were William A. Scott the third, the photographer. I believe there was Sergeant Allen. Um, I can't remember the other names. Approximately how many men? I say there were you? about four, four or five of us at the most, counting the lieutenant. Uh, he knew what he was going to see, I guess, but we did not. At least I didn't. Um, that was the first day on the second day of the camp opening. And the exact date, please. I think it would be April 11th or 12th. I remember that so vividly because I saw, on that day, I saw some of the inmates who had been freed. They were surrounding a, a guard that they had captured, and they were beating him. And they wanted us to join, but we did not. They took him into a building, they beat him to death. Uh, I can understand their feelings. I don't condone what happened, but I certainly understand it. What time of the day did you arrive at the camp? Ooh, I would say it must have been close to the noon hour. I'm not sure, but I know it was in the a.m. And how did you know what the name of the camp was? I was told that this was a place called Buchenwald. Who told you that? Um, hmm. I believe the lieutenant knew. I believe he was Jewish. Yes, I'm pretty sure. I knew he was Jewish, and I think he, he knew. When you arrived there, what, what units had already arrived at the camp that were there before you? I really couldn't tell you. There were different uh, units there. I know that because I walked in and I saw them with the different patches and they, um, they were walking around looking just as we were. What had your um, commanding officer told you just prior to your arrival at that camp that prepared you for what you were about to see? Oh, nothing. Nothing was done to prepare, prepare us for what we were going to see. Um, I, I knew that no one talked about the camps. Uh, we just happened to, the American forces just happened to come upon them. And I think when they did, the, the shock was traumatic, you see, because they were not aware of all these things that were going on. Maybe some had heard some news or something had filtered back to them, but not to me. I don't think the rank and file knew too much. Uh, therefore, we, we had to take that trauma. Describe to me what you heard as you approached. The camp? I didn't hear too much. I, said, I heard a noise that came from talking, people mumbling and talking. And, um, and I heard some groaning because uh, people were in pain. Um, but then when I walked in, uh, it just it, I was overwhelmed. People were coming towards me, and they uh, were wanting some sustenance. I, I took what I had in my fatigue pants, the C ration, the K ration, and I gave it to them, which was not the thing to do. We were later told to give food to people like that is to kill them because their bodies couldn't handle it. They'd been starved for so long. I, you see, in, in ignorance, you do the wrong thing. But I thought basically I was trying to do the right thing. 
What did you smell when you approached the camp Ooh. before you opened the barrack doors? It's hard to describe a smell. Uh, that's one thing that, uh, you know, you can talk about things, but that's one thing that you can't really get a handle on. Um, the sweetness that comes from burning flesh, you know, that, that was some of that still around, I think. Um, and then, of course, all the other horrible smells that come from decay um, and human waste. Yeah. What kind of orders did you have? Well, my orders then uh, was to, we were to leave and we were to go back to report where we might set up camp if we came to Buchenwald. Uh, we went back and the next day, uh, I think our unit moved up closer to Buchenwald, to Weimar. And then I think we sent in our uh, water purification and also some of our trucks came in to help move some of the people who could be moved. I'm referring to what were your orders as you approached the camp for the first time? Oh, our orders were really, uh, let's look for a campsite. We were looking for a place where we might be able to do certain things. I think the lieutenant was knowledgeable about that, what, what he had in mind. Uh, we were long, I guess, as soldiers for protection or whatever. We didn't know what we were going to encounter, so you, you don't go alone. So about the four or five of us were there in the truck. And as you approached the camp, mm -hmm. the perimeter of the camp, describe that for me. I recall that we drove through the center of town, and it looked just like almost any other town that uh, you might see. And then I recall going up a slight incline, very slight, and then all of a sudden I began to see what might look like, uh, not barricades, but metal thick guards across the road on the side roads. And when I got near the camp, there were some more barricades. And then all of a sudden you came into an open space in front of the camp. And I, I pulled alongside another vehicle and parked. What kind of vehicle was it? I don't know whether it was a Jeep. There were Jeeps all around, you know, the, from the different units that came in. And so what people were just outside the camp? There were some soldiers outside the camp. Um, I don't know how many, but they were there. How were you affected by what you saw? Well, I don't know. I, I think that I was not the same anymore. You know, I came in with one feeling of anger at my country, really angry about what was happening to me, but now, now I realize that all the pain and suffering is not relegated to just me and those like me. That pain can touch everybody, so many different kinds of people, and that's what I saw there. And it changed me, it made me know that we have a connection, that what happens to you can happen to me. What I saw happening to those people, I said, Leon, that could be happening to you. And it's all because of bigotry and prejudice and, and all of that hate that any Semitism was right there. It had been carried to the ultimate. And I knew that that was something we had to get rid of because I had experienced it, you see. I was told that I wasn't good enough. These same people in here were told by Nazi Germany that they weren't good enough. And so they didn't, they couldn't be allowed to live. So, yeah, I, I became a different person. I knew we had to do something about that evil. Approximately how many men, how many women were there in the camp as inmates? The young man spoke to us about some figures, but whether he was accurate or not, I don't know. Uh, uh, first, How many did you see? How oh, oh, I saw, oh gee, so many. I saw uh, Americans, you know, and, uh, I saw, I saw some Singalese Africans who had been put there with the tribal marks on their face, but only a handful. Uh, they were probably with the French, and, and they had been captured, and I guess they put them there in the camp. Uh, I didn't see any American soldiers who had been captured. I seen, I, I saw the, the very different different kinds of people there. The Jews, you could distinguish them by the stars of David. Um, 
the gypsies, you could see a few of them around. And what kind of markings did they have? I've forgotten what markings they had, but they were much darker in complexion than uh, the others that I saw. Uh, it's hard to distinguish between those who might be Catholics unless they were priests and wore, wore the garb, and I didn't see too much of that. So it was pretty hard when you start seeing people in uniforms and everybody pretty much looking the same. Um, and some of these things I didn't know until I got back and began to, to learn about all those things that I had seen, you know, the purple color and this and the signifying this and who were the homosexuals. And I didn't know much about that until I got home and started learning. In fact, I didn't know the enormity of what I had seen. I thought Buchenwald was it, but I didn't know that Buchenwald had been replicated all across Europe. And then they start talking about the numbers when I got home. Uh, they start talking about millions, millions. It's hard to fathom that. And, and when the man told me that there were about 50,000 uh, prisoners in Buchenwald uh, about two or three weeks before you got here, but then they began to do something to, ki to kill them off, taking them on marches out in trucks. And, and so when I got to the camp, there were only about 20,000 left. So it made me know that there was an organized, systematic way of destroying people. How old are the people, the inmates, that you saw appear to be? Hmm. I guess that's pretty hard to say because I guess the young, very, very young died early. They didn't have any use. They couldn't work, you know, see. You know, and they died of starvation and disease right off and brutality. But I guess the strong survived. So how old did they appear I would to say, be? I would say... <coughs> It's hard to say what their accurate age was, but they looked like they were in their 50s, uh, even older people, so gaunt looking, um, deep set eyes, bad teeth or none at all, uh, skeletons. It's hard to determine age when you look at that. I said appear. How old did they appear to they be? Appear but you, you answered. Okay. You said you've cross the barracks, you cross the, the threshold of the barracks. Can you describe the material that the barracks was constructed of? Oh, gee, it was wood, wood I know that, but the kind of wood I, I couldn't say. But they were wood, and the people were on those that had to stay there because if they could get up and go out, they would have been outside. But those who were still in there were still sick and weak. They had a place where maybe four or five of them could sleep alongside one another. And there were tears. There was another level like the bunks. Um, yes. We're going to change tape. Leon Bass, you were describing to me the barracks inside when you entered. Yes. I, I didn't see anything that would give comfort to those who were living there. I didn't see pillows. I didn't see blankets. I, didn't, I just saw people, inmates, with their uh, striped garments or whatever they had on. And they were, they were with their gaunt faces just looking. And uh, most of them were looking from a prone position because they were too weak to get up. Their reaction to you? It was one of just looking. You couldn't tell whether it was amazement or whether it was, uh, I'm so glad, or whether uh, whatever it was. It was just shock. How many barracks would you estimate were there? Hmm. That's a good question. It's hard to say. I know there must have been... Well, you see, I didn't walk all over the camp. I walked through a certain area. I guess there might have been five or six barracks in, in that area. But as soon as I saw as much as I could take, then that, that was it for me. But I, I do know that all those barracks were raised by the Russians. What kind of laboratory facilities did you see? I didn't see any. I didn't see any. They must have been there, though, but I didn't see them. How did the people who did not speak English, other than this one boy that you related, yes. uh, how did they communicate with you? Uh, they came up with their hands out, you know. There's some who were not so sick would do this. It means they want c cigarettes. Uh, and the word chocolate, you know, that's a famous word they could say, and they knew we had that inside the C and K rations. Um, 
those that could speak some English would try, you know. But uh, you didn't want to get too close. And unfortunately, the, the disease was rampant in the camp. It's, they had all kinds of things going on. People had lice, in the, there was diphtheria, the cholera, all kinds of things that come with deprivation. And uh, so you, you try to keep your distance, you see. And so you wouldn't try to distribute things because if you did, then they long run. You, you just give it to one or two and you, you back away. How many dead bodies did you see? Oh. Just give me an approximate estimate. I guess I saw about maybe 30. Those in the ovens, those outside waiting their, their turn to go in and those that I saw alongside the barracks who were there. And I guess some of them were dead and others were dying. Uh, In the four hours or the five hours that you said you were there, how many deaths did you witness, uh, if any? It's hard to say. I, I heard them say they killed the German soldier. I saw, like I said, people up propped up against the wall. Um, some, I, I pretty thought for sure, were dead. And then there were others being supported by others, and, and many of them seemed to me, and I'm not a doctor, to be on the point of no return, that they, they, they wouldn't live. What inmate in particular stands out in your mind? The inmate that stands out is not one that I saw when I came into the camp. His name is Robbie Waisman. Uh, he saw me. I didn't see him. Uh, I found out about him because I was going to Vancouver to speak, and he got on the telephone to tell me that he knew me, and I told him I didn't know him, and he had me at a disadvantage. But he said, I know you because you were my messiah. You were my liberator. You came in to the camp. I was 16 years of age, he said, and I was skin and bone, but I pulled up and looked over the windowsill in my barrack, and I saw you and your friend, Scott, and said, I remember you because you were black. And I had never seen a black person before, he said. But I remember you. You were my Messiah. And I said, oh, my God. And so I went up to Vancouver, and I met Robbie Waisman. And Robbie and I became good friends. We, we, he went with me when I spoke at the university, and he... Which university? It was Vancouver, University of Vancouver. And for the first time, Robbie decided to speak, which he had never done before, because he had lost all of his family, save, his, save one, his sister to survive. And he, he stood up with tears running down his face, telling people his story. And I admired him so much for his courage. And he and I have become good friends. We traveled all over Vancouver, um, seeing the sights, showing me the round, and then at the same time going to the synagogue and going to different places to speak to young people. And, uh, and then the Canadian Broadcasting Company t uh, filmed all of this. And then when we came back home, uh, they came to the airport when he said farewell to me. They filmed that. And then he came up to Philadelphia. He was invited to come and give me the humanitarian award from the Interfaith Council on the Holocaust, of which I was a member. And he came up. And the Canadian Broadcasting Company came with him and went to the private school where I was teaching. And I was teaching a lesson on the Holocaust, and they came in and filmed that. And then they filmed Robbie giving me the award. So that was the one person that I've had a very close contact with. I have met others that Robbie knew, and he introduced me to them. But uh, he's the one person that stands out. So... Uh, you stand out in his mind. Is there one person that stands out in your mind that you may have encountered when you entered? One person that I saw? Not that I can remember, no. Again, we'll go back. You mentioned some of the buildings that you saw. Um, what were the guards' quarters like? Uh, 
at that time I didn't know, but I found out later that the quarters outside of the compound were the ones that were held the SS, I guess, and some of the hierarchy. Um, when I went back in 1992, I saw them. They were being used now for visitors' information and so forth, but they are the only ones that were still standing. The others were, had been raised except for one barrack that was still standing and the crematorium. That's all. When you were there, did you see any brothels? No, I didn't. I didn't see. I heard that these kinds of things went on, uh, but I didn't see any women either because um, the men and women were separate, as you know. What animal pens did you see? I didn't see, not to my recollection, any animal pens, but I knew uh, from what they but I know that they had dogs that they used to maintain order. <laughs> what hospital facilities were there? Oh, I didn't see any hospital facilities. The only thing that I saw that were close to hospital was the, the trucks coming in with the Red Crosses on them, our medical groups coming in to do something. Something a very observant person might have seen, whether it was writings, or anything that would illustrate or illuminate the purpose of the camp by the inmates? Hmm. No, I didn't see anything that the inmates would do. I, I only saw the clock on the outside as I came through the gate that had the time up there of the, of the time it was taken. I, uh, I didn't see anything else. What camp personnel were left when you were there? The camp personnel, American camp personnel? German. German. There were no Ger I saw that one soldier, that was all. I understand that they fled when they knew we were coming. They knew the war was just about won. Um, and again, describe to me that incident where the inmates took the guard. Oh. Yes, that I came up on accidentally. I walked up on that and I saw these people milling around and uh, I looked and I saw this uh, a soldier in his uniform and uh, they would hit him and he would fall down and they would say, Aktum! And he would jump up and stand up and they would hit him again and he'd fall down. And they kept doing that and uh, then they took him into the barracks. And I was later, I heard that they had beat him to death. What were your orders regarding the survivors? Our, our orders, were, there were no orders given concerning the survivors. Um, no one had been assigned yet to be in charge of that camp. This was people just milling around, you see, those who were able to walk and some were much in better health than others and those who were not in good health were struggling just to move about. Others were on the ground. So the camp was really in a disorder, uh, disarray. And I think someone had to be assigned later on, I think, to pull it together. And I think after about maybe a week, I guess, some order came and our trucks came in and helped to move those that needed to be moved. And water purification, which we had to give them. But there were others there too doing things. The uh, K rations or C rations that you um, gave the inmate how did they react? Oh, they were so glad to get them. They just reached out greedily and grabbed what they could, and uh, I, they probably shared it with someone else after they could tear the wrappers and things off. Um, How did you know it wasn't good for them? Later on, someone told me, he said, that's too rich. The vitamins in the chocolate bar alone was just too much. But uh, that's something I regret. What medical facilities were set up while you were there? I didn't see anything being set up. I just saw the trucks coming in. I knew the doctors and nurses were probably going to do something. So what food were the inmates given? If From, I, I didn't see any food, but I, I later found out that they got meager rations, a piece of bread, a potato. Uh, I don't know. It, it's from the condition of which the people were in, I would say they were getting little or nothing. Mm -hmm. 
what burial details were, were made? I didn't see the burial details. I was told about them. I just know that people who were dead had to be moved. But I, by looking around me, I could see that that wasn't being done. Because some of the inmates told me um, much later that the camp had been taken over by the, the inmates, that the Germans fled though they could get away. But the inmates took over and started handling running the camp um, before the Americans walked in. So when I got on the scene, you see, it, uh, nobody had to fire a shot. Everything was just quiet except for the voices of people. So um, you, uh, you didn't see any burial detail? Mm -hmm. um, what mass graves did you see? I didn't see any mass graves. Uh, no one ever pointed out any graves to me. What, uh, what civilian personnel did you see from the surrounding areas coming oh. in? I didn't, I didn't see any civilians coming in when I was there, but I heard that the orders were given to have them come in. So what were they doing with the dead people when you were there? No one was doing anything, nothing. Those who fell stayed where they were. If they had good friends, they might do something for them, pull them up, sit them up. But no one was in a position to do much for anyone else. The strength they had, they probably used it for themselves. Was there a chaplain in, in the camp at the time? <laughs> I don't know if there were. Um, if, I'm pretty sure there must have been some military chaplains uh, in there. Um, So then how were you told it was time to leave? The officer we came with pretty much said, we've been here now long enough. I guess we had seen more than we want to even have to try to talk about now. But it was time to leave, so he said, let's go, and we, we were all ready to go. Is there anything that you might have seen that you may have forget forgotten to relay to me? I see, have seen or heard? I can't say. The only thing that I can't describe is the smell, the odor. That's a hard thing to try to put into words, but it's something that you can never forget. And uh, I know now if you go back there, the things have been sanitized and laundered so much that uh, the only people who can deal with that would be those who went through it, and maybe those of us who saw it. But other than that, you just go back and see what's left. With whom did you discuss the events of that day? We At the time? At the time we got on the truck, we didn't say anything about what we saw that day at that camp, which makes me know now that my friends were just as traumatized as I was. And nobody talked about that. Not e even at later on, there was no talk as far as I can remember, by me to anyone, you know, anyone to me. I came home and I didn't talk. My parents passed away not knowing that I had walked into that camp and all of the things that I saw. I never talked. My children were teenagers when they first heard about my experience. Must have been almost 25 years. It only occurred when I went to that school in Philadelphia. I was uh, assigned as principal. We'll get to that. Um, in a uh, that's the time, okay. What orders were you given when you left the camp? There were no orders, just to go back to where we were and uh, join up with the rest of them. And they moved up closer uh, to the camp and uh, I didn't want to go anymore, so I didn't go back, and uh, some of the others went in. I don't know how many of our battalion went in, but I know that the those who rendered a service did go in, the truck drivers, the um, water purification people. That's how, 
Were there Jewish soldiers there? And if there were, what were their reactions? That I couldn't tell you. When I saw soldiers, I wouldn't know whether they were Jewish, or Irish, or German, or what. They were just American soldiers. <laughs> what artifacts or memorabilia were you able to take with you from that camp? I took nothing. Not one thing. The only thing that I have from that camp is the photograph that William A. Scott took, and he let me know that he had it, and he gave me a copy. Where did you go when you left Buchenwald? We went back to our unit, and uh, I, I stayed with the unit continually to do reconnaissance work, uh, looking for materials and things that we can do to fix bridges and so forth, because the units were still moving, the war was still on. But then, just a few days later, the war ended. Of course, President Roosevelt died first. I was rather sad. He never saw the end of the war. Then the war ended, and that was a relief for all of us in the ETO. So how long did you stay in Europe? Well, I stayed in Europe until, um, oh gee, I'm trying to put things together. Um, A few, about, I guess, about another two months or more. In Amridgeville. And then we were sent down into Marseille, France, to a staging area. And there our unit was disbanded, and all of us were assigned to different units. I was assigned to a service unit, a dump truck company, which took me for 30 days on a ship all the way down to the Philippines. We went through the Panama Canal. On the other side of the canal, they'd, we heard the news that they dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I thought surely the war, they would turn us around and take us home, but they didn't. So we went down to Batangas, Batangas, and landed with the landing craft in that area. And we were billeted in a bombed-out convent on Santa Mesa Boulevard outside of Manila. Stayed there until, oh, a little after Christmas. And then finally I had enough points to come home, and that's when I came back to the United States. When you left Buchenwald and went on your way up to France or over to France, what was the atmosphere regarding the war? I think it was jubilant. Uh, I think so many were saying, gee, we made it, we had lived to go through all of this, it's all over. I know that was going through my mind. I said, gee, I, I worried every day, will I make it back home? There was so much I left undone that I wanted to do with my life, and I was so happy to know that now I had a chance. And what had you seen in regard to the devastation of the American soldiers? The American soldiers, there were so many that died. In the How many of your buddies? In my, in many of my buddies, not too many. Uh, I couldn't speak for the line companies. I was in the headquarters company, and I didn't get to see many of them in terms of what they were doing. But I don't think we lost too many, thank God. Uh, I think there were accidents, yes, and a couple of officers were lost with a uh, landmine. But I think that's about it. When were you discharged from the Army? I was discharged in January. <laughs> it's hard to remember that exact date. I should. I know I, I landed in California on January 23rd, 1946. And I think I got out of the Army in just about a couple of weeks. So I, it was pretty early. I got out. Of, must have been late Jan, not late January, early February must have been. What was your final rank? I was a sergeant at that time. Um, but I think the best rank was civilian uh, when I got that. <laughs> and uh, I was glad to get out of the service. I, uh, military was not for me. I knew now that war never solved anything. And I had a different frame of mind concerning fighting to solve a problem. What kind of awards were you honored? 
Well, I got what most soldiers get. That's a good conduct award. And then I got three bronze stars for participating in three campaigns in the European theater. Um, that's about it. So tell me what happened in your life after your discharge from the Army. Well, I wondered what I would do with my life. I, I had makeup for almost three years of service. And uh, I knew I wanted to go to college. My father had always talked about it, and I got this insight from the fellows in the service with me. But I didn't have money, and I thought it would never happen. But then I became aware of the GI Bill of Rights, and I knew that I had a chance. So I checked several colleges, and one of them happened to be a place called Westchester State College. It's now called a university. And I went out to Westchester and went down to the college. And I registered and became a student there at that institution. And that was a good time for me, a happy time, because I was the first one in my family to go to college. But then I found out something. I found out that the face of evil was in Westchester. It was in the town, and it was in on the college campus, because shortly after registering, I found out that I couldn't live in the dormitory. That was not possibility for me, merely because I was black. I. It's hard to describe my feelings because I had done so much. I laid my life on the line. I put in three years in the military, and here I'm being denied what I was fighting for. So that, that didn't sit well with me, and I was still that angry, angry young man. Uh, in town, you couldn't eat in the restaurants. You know, in the movies, uh, the theater there, you had to sit in the balcony. But one day I went in and I refused to sit in the balcony. And I walked in and sat down on the main floor. And that was my protest, you see. I was letting him know that I was good enough. But I became frightened as I thought about what I'd done because I thought they were going to put me in jail. They would do it in a minute, you see. And I wouldn't be able to graduate from college, so my fears mounted. But nobody came. Nobody came to the theater, and I left there. I went back feeling so good about what I had done. And I stood up for what I believed to be right. And it was a risk, but I didn't think the price was too high. And I felt good about that. So I graduated from college, and I came into Philadelphia, and I became a teacher. And that was very gratifying. I'm going to teach now. I'm going to teach a fifth grade class in an all-black elementary school. Because, you know, separate but equal is still operative. I was teaching about 49 youngsters in an overcrowded class, an overcrowded school. <laughs> and I found it difficult to convey to them that they could solve their problems without fighting each other. You, you just can't do that. You, but it was hard here. I'm angry, too, at what's going on, and trying to get this over to other people was very difficult. But then one day the clarion voice of Dr. Martin Luther King came out of the Deep South, and he was saying things that I just could not fathom. And he was saying that we had to love people and care. And I thought the man was out of his mind. He, he had to be weird to be saying this to people when they were doing all kinds of terrible things to people. But he prevailed, and I soon came to know that this was the way, because he was successful. And so I joined in with that kind of thinking, and uh, it was a very, very warm feeling. And I went to Washington, D.C. in 1963 and stood there with so many people uh, waiting to hear from him. He came out to the microphones, and what a day that was when he said, I have a dream. And I knew that was my dream, and I knew that I could, I could do something, and I cried. But I came back to Philadelphia, and I worked hard as a teacher, and then 
they said they were going to integrate the schools in Philadelphia, and I was going to be sent to an all-white school. I had now become principal, you see. I was principal of an elementary school in South Philadelphia. It was a historically all-black elementary school, wonderful place to be, and I was gratified that I had that chance to grow and learn in that area. But then... What was the name of the school? It was called the Walter George Smith School. And uh, I took all of that experience and, and training and love that the teachers and the parents had given me, and I took it with me up to the Ed, uh, Edwin Forrest Elementary School, which was an all-white school in the northeast of Philadelphia, Cottage in Bly. And I remember going up there with reservations. Uh, <laughs> but I understand they had reservations, too, about my coming. But it was amazing what happens when you get into proximity and you work with it. And we did. And it was a wonderful experience. But one day I had a chance to go to Houston, Texas on a convention for elementary school principals. And I went up to Houston, Texas, and in the evening for recreation, some of the fellows got together and said we'd go see a baseball game at the uh, Astrodome. That's the first one with the roof on it, I believe, the first stadium. So we went there and we were sitting waiting for the game to start when they flashed on the scoreboard out in center field. Dr. King was shot. And I was stunned. I really was. But the people around me kept saying things that were horrible. They got that SOB, we're going to get the rest of those, so on. Ooh, I couldn't believe it. But they flashed again in about 10 or 15 minutes. Dr. King was dead. And those people got up and began to applaud. You know, Not everybody, but those in proximity to me. So I got up and walked out. And that night I saw on the television all the things that were happening in the big cities, the burning, the looting, the killing, things that were diametrically opposite to what Dr. King had been speaking about. People thought they'd lost a dream because they'd lost a dreamer. That wasn't true, but that's what they thought. So I, I went back to my school, and it took me some time to pull myself together after this experience. We're going to change tapes, I'm sorry. Leon Bass, you were talking about Dr. King. Yes, I was talking about the great loss that this country, the world, had felt because of his death. And uh, I came back, I was shaken up by this, I, but I knew I had to continue on. So I did. And then I received a communication a few months later from the superintendent of schools, the late Dr. Mark Shedd. He called me and told me that he wanted to talk to me, and I went down to see him. And he said, I have a school that needs a high school that needs a principal. And let I thought. Me, let me interrupt you one moment and ask you what qualifications did you have at this time? Oh, yes, I, I had gone to, to for my graduate degrees, I had gone to Temple University. I got my master's degree there. I got my certification as a secondary school principal. I'm, and then I got my certification as a superintendent. And then I continued on and I got my doctorate degree in, back in 1982. Yeah. So I was I had my master's degree and I was certified as an elementary school, as a senior high school principal before that, before I got my doctorate. Um, but as I was in the high school, I continued to go to school and that's when my doctorate became possible. But I was offered this opportunity to go to this school and I accepted. Little did I know that I was going to go into a maelstrom of unrest as was ex being experienced all across this country and especially in our high schools. Uh, this was an all-black high school. What name? The William uh, Benjamin Franklin High School. It was right down in the center of the city. And it was an all-male school. There were no girls in the school. Student population, 99% black, 1% Hispanic. Maybe four or five kids who were white. 85% of the faculty were white place was in turmoil. I arrived on the scene and there was a big demonstration and the youngsters were out in front of the school 
I don't know what the demonstration was about. They demonstrated at the drop of a hat things then. I um, had to get through to the school, so I, I went through. One young man stopped me. He wanted to know who I was, and I told him. He said, oh, you're the new dude they made principal here. And I said, that's what they've been telling me. And that's when he called the fellows and said, look, he's here. I didn't know. They had been asking for a long time to have an African-American as their principal. So I was chosen, and they crowded around me, and I, I knew I was in trouble then. They, they wanted to know what my plans were for the school. What was I going to do? And I, and I told them, I said, fellas, I just got here. Give me a break. Back up now. And one young man said, if you don't do something now, you know, we're going to burn this place down. And I knew I had my work cut out for me, you know. So I, I walked around that school for a couple of months with a dull headache. And then one day on that tour of duty, I came by this classroom and I heard the noise. And I looked in and I saw some of these young men, they were angry, they were demonstrating they're angry by being inattentive, doing things that were not quite right for a classroom. So I stepped in further and I saw this lady. She wasn't the teacher, no. She was a visitor. She was a survivor. She had survived one of the worst concentration camps in Europe. She came out of a place called Auschwitz. And she had been invited on this day by a good friend to come and speak to these young men about her experiences. But they were not listening attentively. So I had to step in. And I said to them, fellas, you, you better listen. All of this is true, and I know it is because I was there. I saw it. They got quiet. She shared her pain. She told them how she'd lost her a mother and a father, her grandmother, grandfather, lost all of those who, that she loved so dearly. And in the end, the only one that came out, I think, in her family was this young lady. Her name is Nina Kaleska. And she's the only one that came out alive. She's living today in Phil around Philadelphia area. She came out alive. Those young men listened to her. I know they did by the questions they asked, and they came forward and they looked at numbers that had been tattooed on her arm by the Nazis. They shook her hand, and then they went out of that classroom in silence, which made me know she had communicated. So then she came up to me with tears in her eyes and talked to me for a long time and convinced me that I too had something to say. So. After all of these years, I began to speak about my experiences. The fact that I became an eyewitness to the horror that had been perpetrated by the Nazis in Germany and across all of Europe. I traveled all across the country. I've been into Canada. I've been into maximum security prison. I go everywhere that anybody would listen and tell them what I experienced. But to let them know that the evil is still with us. It has not gone away. We have just to look at the news on the television and the papers, the Bosnia, Bosnia ethnic cleansing, Rwanda, oh, Ireland, uh, all the places. In our own country, we have Oklahoma City. We have the terrible deeds committed by these people down in Texas when they dragged the man behind the, automobile, the truck. So you see, the evil is still with us. I'm talking about racism, anti-Semitism. I'm talking about bigotry and prejudice. I'm talking about all of that hate and more. That stuff is still with us. And it's up to us to deal with it. And we've got to fight it. And when I talk to young people about this, I tell them, it's not easily done. It's not easily done. If, if you dare to fight the evil, I always say to them, if you dare to be a Daniel, if you dare go into that den of evil and stand up, you better be ready because the pain can be excruciating. The people that you thought you could be friends with will turn on you and talk about you. Why are you talking about that Holocaust? Why are you talking about all this racism? You dare to stand up. Be ready for the pain, something you didn't create. No, you didn't create it, but you're going to take the pain. But then you have to answer the question, is the price too high? It's the price too high to stand up for what you believe is right. Now, I don't believe it is, but you see, I can't speak for other people. I can only speak for Lima. So, 
you must do this. You must stand up for it and take the pain and the blame. And so young people ask me, what can you give me to fight the evil? And I always tell them there's only two things that I can think of that's important. One is your education. If you can't read, write, or do your computational skills, you're in trouble. You could become a victim, or you might make somebody else a victim in your ignorance. And then I say the other piece of the action is love. And the love I'm talking about is not that superficial love in the movies and television and so forth. It's the love that will cause you to stand up and be counted. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. So they listen, I hope. And then I close and I tell them that the words of the great writer James Baldwin, who said, either we love one another, either we hold to one another, or that sea will engulf us and the light will go out. And I remind them that we have an awesome responsibility, all of us, to keep the light shining. What kind of questions did those students ask the survivor? They wanted to know how could anybody let this happen? That's a question that comes up quite often. What did you do about it? They have no idea the difficulties that people found themselves in. No one said anything. No one opposed this man until it got to the point where he got so powerful the Nazi regime was so powerful that if you dared to speak, it was to die. And so that's the way it was. So people didn't speak up soon enough. When you give your speeches, mm -hmm. what kind of questions do the oh. audience ask you? And sometimes I get people who say, hey, hey, it didn't happen. And I have to let them know there's no possible way for you to stand here and intelligently tell me that it didn't happen when the Nazis' own films, when their own records convicted them at Nuremberg. Irrefutable evidence. And yet you say to me that it didn't happen? It's wrong. You're going to have to do a second look. But I know sometimes there are people who would like to give Hitler and his minions, uh, what you might say, a victory posthumously. But we're not, we're not going to let that happen. Some of the other questions they ask me, why do you, Leon, as a black person, why are you talking about this Holocaust when it's something that happened with white people and Jews? And I say, well, it's not black and it's not white. It's a human problem. And then I remind them, I said, my father fought in the First World War, and he told me much later in my life that when he left France, he, some of the black soldiers stayed there. They felt that chances for a better life would, would be better in Europe. And so those soldiers stayed, and some of them married and had children. Well, when Hitler came on the scene, he saw the black mixed-blood children, these mulattoes. He said, they are bastards of the Rhineland. And so he rounded up as many as he could, and he sterilized them. And then he sent those he could off to camps, concentration camps. They disappeared and were never heard of again. So I reminded them, I said, now if you and I, we are black, had we been living in Europe at that time, possibly we wouldn't be here today. So it's your problem, too. Which of your brothers also served in the service? All of us were in the service. Uh, one was in the Merchant Marine, uh, two were in the Navy, and two of us were in the Army. And when did you marry? Oh, I... I married shortly after I went to Westchester State Teachers College. I met a young lady there in 1946, and in 1948 we were married. Her and name? Her name is Mary Catherine Sullivan, and I added the word Bass to her last name. Uh, we were married. I, we both continued to go into school. We were determined to finish. Um, I graduated in 1949. In three years, by going to summer school, I got out early. And I was teaching, and she continued on and got out in 1950, and she began to teach. Mm -hmm. And from your marriage, or your date of, uh, date of marriage again was? It was October 16th, 1948. And from that marriage, what children were born? We have two children. Our firstborn was Leon Jr., and uh, our second, 
was Delia, De Delia Marie Bass. They're both, uh, well, they both have been married. My son is divorced, but my daughter is married, and her name is Dandridge now. And their achievements in life? Oh, my son went to George School, which is a Quaker school, secondary school. Uh, both of them did that. Upon graduation, he went to Cornell. When he finished, he went out to the West Coast and attended USC in area of social work. After f about five years of that, he decided to go to law school. He went up to Berkeley and attended Bolt, the law school. They call it Bolt. So he's a practicing attorney in California, Los Angeles. Our daughter, Delia, went off to Tufts University. She came out of the college and couldn't find a job, and she was majored in French from sixth grade all the way up through college, but couldn't find a job. So finally she went into banking, a man's world. But she passed the test and got into banking, and after a struggle, being a woman, being black, that glass ceiling was, you know, there, but she, in spite of that, became a vice president, and she's with the uh, First Union Bank in Princeton, and I'm very proud of her, too. And grandchildren from those marriages? Oh, yes, yes. We have three grandchildren, all boys. Um, my son has one, his name is Ananda. Uh, Nanda is fifth, is going to be 18 in August, this August. And Jason, the comedian, he's 15. Uh, they both are doing well. They're in high school now. My daughter has one little boy. He's six years of age. That's Julian Blake Dandridge. Yeah. Yeah. What did you tell your family about your experiences during the war? Once I, I told them about things that had happened to me, but never about going into the concentration camp. But once that came, came common knowledge and it was put, publicized in the newspaper, then I had to tell them all about it. And they've been very supportive of me since. I tried to talk about things without getting into some of the gruesome details, but just to let them know that it was horrible. If they push hard and they want to know more, I will talk about it. What was their reaction? They just felt, as I did, that this was totally unnecessary. What happened there could have been prevented. But people turned their backs. Anti-Semitism was strong in Europe, especially in Poland, but all across Europe. Uh, and people thought, well, it happens to them, it's not going to happen to me. So many people did that. Even some Jews felt that it was something that would pass away, but it didn't. And then the, once the juggernaut got going, it was hard to stop it. And so I tell youngsters that's how it got going, because that quotation about the only time that evil can triumph is when good people do nothing. Well, that's true, and I, was, I tried to let them know that. How have your experiences affected choice of you, choices you have made throughout your life? Well, um, I know now more than I've ever known that you can't judge a person by the superficial things, religion, color, the amount of money they have, the clothes they wear, the home they live in, the jobs they hold, no. You have to just get to know people, and you can determine the kind of personalities they are. But in spite of who or what they are, how bad they might be and things they might do, they're still worthy of my consideration because they, too, are part of me. We're all in the same family, you see, the human family. And I just can't disregard them because they do evil things. Nobody is beyond redemption, you know. And so I have to continue, and it's hard, <laughs> believe me, it's hard to try to think that way, but I keep reminding myself that there but for the grace of God go I. I could have fallen into that trap. I didn't have to be born in this country. I didn't have to be born to the parents I was born to. I didn't have to have all those good things happening that happened to me. 
there but for the grace. So I, I keep reminding myself that it's a struggle to be better than you are. It's a struggle not to give up when you're mistreated. How did those experiences change you as a person from the person that you were as a teen? Well, it made me more aware. It sensitized me to the needs of others. That you can't deny people equal access to things. You can't deny a person an education. You can't deny them opportunity for, to get one. You can't cover him with dung and then shoot him for stinking. That's my expression. You've got to give people a chance an opportunity. The playing field has to be leveled. Now, after that is done, after you've got those hurdles out of the way, now it's up to the person to make that move. So I, for one, and I throw this in, I believe that affirmative action was a good thing. So was the GI Bill of Rights, which was a form of affirmative action. It was a good thing. It opened the door for many of the GIs to make their way and to have a good life after the war. Affirmative action opened the doors for many young students, and I know that because I worked with the students, and they went ahead. Were things done wrong? Yes. People always abuse things, but that doesn't stop what was being done from being good. So keep that in mind. Who from your unit, unit have you been in touch with? Well, the late William A. Scott the third, uh, who passed away, I was always in touch with him. He, he uh, was doing some of the same things I was doing. He was speaking about his experience, uh, the one we had together. Um, he was quite a chess man, and he used to play chess with the colonel, He's, who was a general, our Colonel Fuller. He lived somewhere down in Maryland, I believe, but he used to communicate with him, and they would play chess together ac across the wave lights. <laughs> um, I also visited him. He visited me. Um, and what did you talk about in regard to those experiences that you shared? We talked about the places we had been, the people we had met, the soldiers we were comrades with, the ones that we were very close to that we knew. Um, we talked about what we were doing in terms of the Holocaust and racism. Yeah, those are things that we talked about. And is there anything else you'd like to add about your friend Robbie Waisman? No, Robbie and I are, st are good friends, and I just talked with him a few weeks ago. He has invited me back to Vancouver uh, to come and speak, and uh, I've got it set up on my calendar that I'm going to go back and probably spend a week with him at his home and walk, go around speaking at various places in Vancouver. Uh, I don't get to see him as often because of the distance, but we do talk on the telephone. And uh, he lets me know that uh, we are still very close. What more would you like to add mm -hmm. about what you saw, even if you believe it might be something that the general public couldn't handle, that the historians couldn't handle? Mm -hmm. I I don't think there are things that I could say that would be beyond the ability of people to handle now that the Holocaust and all of this ugliness has been put out there for people to see. Uh, Mr. Spielberg did a tremendous job when he took Schindler's List and made it one in which it was not overkill, but it was enough to get people to know the horror of that. And I remember so vividly how this woman was telling this officer that the commandant, uh, that the, what they were doing was wrong. They were building this thing and it was not right. And, uh, and she said, I'm an engineer, I'm an architect or something like that. And that was wrong over there. And he pulled his pistol out and he shot her. And then he said to the men, do what she said. That to me was showing the epitome of, of evil. He was the personification of that. And uh, see, Spielberg knew how to do that without just going through all the gore, you know, and it made people focus on what it was. Uh, 
and that's, that's one of the things I'm saying that, that people now know, and I find it very hard for anybody to tell me they don't know, with all the movies and, and the documentaries and everything that's been put out. So people know. So I, there's nothing I could say that I think would shock people. There are things in my life that I'm very sensitive about, things that happened that were humorous and all. Uh, yes, those things I have, but that wouldn't shock anybody, I don't think. Dr. Bass, and all I can say, Dr. Bass, <laughs> knowing that your education so warrants it. Thank you. Why have you decided to give testimony today? Oh, gosh, I, I've been trying to give testimony for a long time by just going around and speaking to people. But I never believed that I would be able to be a part of this large operation that has been funded by Mr. Spielberg uh, and others. Um, this, I think, is one of the best things that could happen. And when it came out, I said, well, Leon, will they approach you? Will they ask you? And so finally someone did. And that's why I'm here today. And I think it's important that I speak what, about what I saw and that others speak about what they saw. Are we looking for credit? No. No one's looking for credit. No one wants a pat on the back. All we want to do is say, will this be prevented? from happening again. That's the most basic thing and the reason why this should be. What message would you like to leave for the young people of the world, for your family, for future generations, for those who deny? Yeah. I guess I come back to what I've been saying all along, that if we want to effectuate a change in the society, if we want to make the world a better place in which to live, then education is one of the keys to that. Education can open the doors. It, it's a slow process, I know, but it's the best process. Learning the skills that you're needed so you can make a living, skills which will give you an understanding of other people and other cultures, things that will help you to travel, whether it's in person or going across the world, or whether it's through books. Education can provide that opportunity. So I say, let's get an education. The other piece of it is the love. And that love is it's not a pat on the back and a pat on the head and saying it's all right and letting people do what they want to do. No, love is when you challenge people and tell them they're wrong, even when they're your best friends. And you tell them, you're wrong, but I love you. That's love. Love is when you stand up in the workplace and tell the boss when he says something that is against women in their employment and you say you're wrong knowing full well that if you do that your chances for promotion or maybe even keeping the job might be threatened but you do it now that's love you see so I, I think those are the important things to remember love is not just something that's superficial and weak love is strong love will enable you to tell your best friend how much you love him and still tell him when he's wrong. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Bass, can you tell me who this person is? This is my mother's mother. It's my grandmother. Her name is Rebecca Weston. She died when I was just a little shaver, about two or three years of age. And how did you happen to have this picture? My Someone in the family had a picture of her, and my cousin was able to, uh, he was an artist, and he was able to draw from the photo. And then we were able to uh, photograph the artwork he did. So therefore, we were able to have this photo. It's one of the few that we have of grandparents. And do you have any idea when it might have been taken? This was such a long time ago. It had to be back uh, in the 1900s. Let's see. I was two or three and she was living then. And that must have been about 70 some years ago. So I think this picture is about, it was taken when somewhere in the uh, 80 years ago. Thank you. And this picture? Uh, this is a picture of my 
mother and my father. Names? And they, my mother is Nancy Weston Bass, and my father is Henry Cleveland Bass. And when was this picture taken? This was taken uh, after the war. And this was back in the early, probably early 50s, 1950s. And the occasion of the picture? Oh, it was just a photo shooting in the yard outside of our home. In what city? This was uh, in a place called uh, Fallcroft, which is right near Sharon Hill. If, uh, some people call it Darby Township, but it's right on the outskirts of uh, Philadelphia in Delaware Township. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this picture, Doctor? Uh, this is a picture of the family uh, at the time of my mother's 75th birthday. And we all came together to celebrate with her. Starting and on the left top. The left top, you will see my brother Harvey, Olden Bass. Next to him is Claude Bass. In the center is my oldest brother, Henry C. Bass. And then my sister, Willabelle Bass. And then yours truly is on the right. Now, down seated on the left is my Aunt Hattie. And then my mother is there in the center, Nancy Bass. And my aunt, uh, Amy Powell. Those are the people there. And the little girl that's peeping out here on the lower right, of course, that's my daughter, Delia. And when was this picture taken? Uh, this was taken, let's see, I'm trying to figure this out now. <laughs> it's hard to remember the exact date of this. Um, I could figure it out if I had a little time. Uh, let's see. Adelia was about, she's 39. This is about 45 years ago. Thank so you. I you can figure from that. Five Leon Bass. The last picture you said was taken in what year? Uh, the last picture was taken in 19, approximately 1967. And can you tell me about this picture? Yes, this picture is, is a picture of the uh, youngest uh, of the brothers in the family. Uh, that's Marcellus Bass. He's with his uh, bride at this time, I believe, is Mildred Jones Bass. Um, and the approximate year that this was taken? This was probably taken in, uh, probably in the, in the 50s, because I think he was just, just about married at that time, and shortly after we were married. Mm -hmm. And what was the occasion of this picture? My, I don't know whether it's a celebration for uh, the wedding anniversary or what it was, but uh, that, that's about it. Thank you. And this picture? Well, this is our daughter, Delia Marie Dandridge. Uh, this picture was taken when, oh, about almost 20 years ago in uh, 19... 1970, I think. And uh, the occasion of the picture? I believe that it was getting close to graduation and I, from Tufts University, and I think she had this photo taken. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this picture? Uh, this is a photograph of, my, of our son, uh, Leon Bass, Jr. It was the time when he was being graduated from Cornell University uh, it was taken in approximately 1970, 70, 1976. Thank you. Yeah. And this picture? Uh, this is a family picture that was taken, oh, a number of years ago, back in the 1980s. And it shows a picture of starting on the top, on the top left. left of my son, Leon Jr. Next to him is Bonnie Beasley Bass, it's her, his wife. And then there's a picture of yours truly right there. And next is Mary Bass, right down a little below. And just above her on the right is Delia, our daughter. And next to her is her husband, uh, Walter Dandridge. And down below, you have. Ananda, 
who is Leon's son, and Jason, who's also Leon and Bonnie's son. And then next there is our Mary's great aunt, Flossie Early. And what was the occasion of this picture? Uh, I believe this was just a family get together, and uh, at a time when Leon and Bonnie brought the two boys from California, and we were celebrating their coming. Thank you. And this? This is a photograph of our special little grandson, Julian Blake Dandridge. Uh, he is, at this time, six years of age and will be attending first grade. Thank you. And this picture, Dr. Bass? Uh, this is a photograph of yours truly, Leon Bass, who is a private in the United States Army. And uh, this was taken in, I believe, in the year 1944, the early part of the year. And what unit were you in? I was in basic training at this time uh, for combat engineers, the 183rd Engineer Combat Battalion. Thank you. And this picture? This is a photograph taken by William A. Scott the third, who you see on the left in the picture. And on the right-hand side, there's Leon Bass, who was, uh, the two of us, us were in Mississippi, and we were in training to be combat engineers. And William A. Scott was the one who set this photograph uh, up. And how did he do that? He had an automatic um, timer, and uh, he set the timer, and then he came back and got into the picture. And in Mississippi where? This was in Mississippi, a place right near Grenada, Mississippi. And uh, this was in 1944. Thank you. And can you tell me about this picture, Dr. Bass? Yes, this picture was taken by William A. Scott the III uh, when we were involved in the Battle of the Bulge. It was a bridge that had to be constructed across um, a chasm there, as you can see, and uh, it was necessary that we put this bridge up because it had to be the link for some of the soldiers in the Third Army to travel up to Baston, which, as you know, was under siege. Um, we built our bridge uh, across, and we were able to make it possible for people across it and to save the men at Baston. And where exactly was this bridge? This bridge is in a place called Montalange, and this photo was taken in uh, 1944. It was around the Christmas season of 44. And Montalange is in, in Belgium. Thank you. And this picture? And this is the picture of members of the 183rd Engineer Combat Battalion building a bridge in a place called uh, Fouché in Belgium. And you can tell by the way they're standing that the weather was terrible. It was close to zero in temperature. But we built the bridge. And where in this picture are you? I'm not in this photograph. I took the photograph. And this was in 1944. It was, um, we were still in the Battle of the Bulge, I believe. Thank you. And this picture, Dr. Bass? This is another bridge that we had to build uh, taking place in Insurange in Luxembourg. At this time, the bulge was over. We were pushing the enemy back, and we were heading towards uh, Germany. But it was on this occasion that we lost uh, two of the officers through uh, mines that they had somehow put on a truck, not knowing that it was ready to go off. And the year again on this This one? was uh, probably in January or February of 1945. Thank you. And this picture, Dr. Bass? This is a picture uh, taken by William A. Scott in the Buchenwald concentration camp. At this time, uh, we were outside of the crematorium, and we were able to get the photos of the 
dead bodies that were there ready to be taken in and burned. Uh, you see the soldier standing there, and I'm the second soldier, I believe, that you see going th Oh no, let me make a correction here. One. Let me see it again. How many soldiers are there? Can I see it? This is the same photo that we were just speaking of before it toppled over. Uh, your position in the line is what number? I am number four, the fourth person, but I'm the third soldier from the left. And the building behind? That's the crematorium is to the right, where just uh, where the bodies are stationed. And how was this for you in these moments? This was a shocking experience for me. I, I had seen dead people before, but nothing like this. Um, those that were killed in battle, that's one thing, but to see people who have been destroyed in an organized, systematic way, merely because they were different or not worthy, according to those who were did it, uh, can be a horrendous experience for anyone. And I was just 20 years of age at this time, so it left a real indelible experience in my mind. And to the best of your recollection, the date that this picture was taken? This was taken, I believe, on April uh, 11th or 12th. I'm not certain of which one of those days, but it was the date that we came into the camp when the camp was taken. I've heard several days. Some say the 11th, some say the 12th. Thank you. And can you tell me about this document? Uh, this document indicates that uh, Leon Bass, who at that time was corporal in the United States Army, was given medals, or you might call it campaign stars, showing the various campaigns in which he participated. And there was a campaign for the Rhineland, there was a campaign for Central Europe, and there was a campaign for the Ardennes. And uh, this was given on the 16th of July, 19. 46, 40, correction, 1945. And what kind of uh, citations or honor? These are uh, battle stars that they gave to us for participating in these three campaigns. Thank you. Dr. Bass, would you please introduce the lovely lady on your my left. I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, my wife, Mary Catherine Sullivan Bass. Mrs. Bass, mm -hmm. how have the stories that your husband related to you about his war experience affect you? Well, I, I think at that point I was just glad that he was out of it by the time he told me anything about it. Go ahead. And, um, you know, we discussed it and thought about it, but it didn't have a bad influence on us. Just sorry it took place. And together you and your husband, what values did you instill upon your own children in regard to tolerance? Mm -hmm. Well, I, we always told our children that you make friends with people who are friendly with you and uh, don't try to assume anything about anybody, anyone. Take them as they are. What message would you like to leave for your grandchildren and for future generations to come about religious and racial tolerance? Well, I'm not too much with the religion, but racial to tolerance. I would like them all to be the same, you know, that you accept people as they are. And if it's someone you don't particularly like or someone who has not been nice to you and you can't get it across to them, just have to leave it alone. 
What would you like to say to your husband at this time? What would I like to say? Well, I'm glad I met you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've had a good life. We've had our ups and downs. And the kids are doing well, so we have no complaints. What is your view about Dr. Bass on the message that he's trying to get across to the young people as an educator? Uh, repeat that. <laughs> what are your views about the, the message that your husband is trying to get across to the young people as an educator? Well, it just seems to me he's always done this ever since he's been in the school system. And um, I haven't seen any great difference, but he tolerates everyone. Thank you. Dr. Bass, mm -hmm. would you like to say anything to your wife at this time in regard to your long marriage to one another? Yes, I, I would like to take this time when we're right on the verge of our 50th anniversary to tell her how much I love her and how much I respect her and how much I re think of her in, in terms of her patience with me in my absence from home on so many occasions when I'm out speaking and at the same time when I'm home and I'm not being what I should be. <laughs> but I appreciate your continued support over all these years. Well, we have each other's support. Well, thank you. And thank you. Mm -hmm.